Hello, welcome to this webcast about the Shellshock Bash code injection vulnerability. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm working for the SANS Technology Institute. In this webcast, we'll very quickly go about some of the highlights of this new high-profile vulnerability. First of all, we'll talk about how important is this vulnerability, whether or not you should panic now, is it more important than Heartbleed or not? Those are some of the questions that are coming up here. What what is the nature of the problem? What went wrong here and uh, why are there two CVE numbers? Is it actually two vulnerabilities or what's going on here? And then how do you check if you are vulnerable and how do you protect yourself from this particular vulnerability? Let's start and just summarize the vulnerability very quickly here to introduce it. This is a vulnerability in Bash. Bash is a component of most Unix systems, in particular Linux systems like Bash a lot and use it as their default shell. Now, you may first think, what's the big deal? The purpose of Bash is to execute code. So how would someone actually exploit this? Turns out that Bash also allows to execute code in environment variables and by someone setting a malicious environment variable they can trick the user into executing code without the user's knowledge. The attacker has to be able to trick the user into opening a bash shell with specific set of vulnerable environment variables and that's the tricky part here and we'll have to talk about how this is accomplished. The vulnerability is big because Pretty much all Unix systems do have Bash. It's big because Linux uses as the default shell. The problem, however, to the attacker is that users usually don't accept environment variables from strangers. So the exploitability here is really where we have to be careful when we are trying to assess this vulnerability. There's really one big way how this vulnerability could be exploited, and that's CGI bin. CGI bin is a way to get a web server to execute scripts. Now, most of the time, you're using other scripting languages for that. You're not using Bash. But as part of CGI specification, the web server will convert headers that are supplied by the user to environment variables. If you are now passing this data to Bash, if you're using Bash to execute these scripts, then Bash is being exposed to these environment variables and an attacker may transmit a malicious environment variable and code is being executed that you didn't expect to be executed. The problem here is that this is not really up to whoever wrote the bash script that you're executing. So they may do everything right. They may validate input, but this code is being executed before it even gets to the stage of validating input. Other attack vectors that have been mentioned is SSH, for example. With SSH, the user can set environment variables. Now, typically that's not a big deal because the user has to authenticate, but sometimes we try to restrict the user to a limited shell. With this vulnerability, they may be able to execute commands that we don't want them to execute. Also, with uh, DHCP, Many Unix systems pick up parameters from DHCP, set environment variables, and then run bash scripts in order to reconfigure the system. Now, this is not that exploitable as some of these other vulnerabilities. However, if it is exploitable, those exploits usually run as root. So this makes this a pretty interesting attack vector. The attacker may execute arbitrary code with this vulnerability as the user who is opening the bash shell. So in the web-based scenario, this would be your Apache web server who is hopefully running in a less privileged role. One use case where this could become a real problem in the CGI bin scenario is an embedded device like a firewall that, for example, has bash scripts running as root in order to adjust firewall rules. And then via a web-based admin interface, this vulnerability could be exploited, in particular if this happens as part of the authentication. So if the authentication itself is a CGI bin script that's running bash, which is less likely, but in this case, an unauthenticated user may be able to pass these environment variables. 
Another thing that makes this a big deal is that the exploit is so easy. There are plenty of proof of concepts out there for the different scenarios. So for an attacker, it would be pretty easy to exploit this vulnerability once they identified a vulnerable system. So this makes this really important. It is important, it is critical if you have web servers that run Bash from CGI bin. At this point, I would almost suggest you go into instant handling mode and don't just blindly patch the vulnerability. It's not an issue for Windows. For clients, you have to be less worried about this other than the DHCP scenario, which of course could be exploited if you're connecting, for example, to a Wi-Fi hotspot, so the coffee scenario uh, that uh, could possibly lead to exploitation here but then again people running around with the linux systems yes i've seen it i've seen a lot of linux at uh, sans conferences but uh, overall that's less of a problem the other problem here is of course bash is so old so every system out there has it like i said the number of vulnerable systems is huge what makes this not so big of a problem is that the number of exploitable system is significantly smaller. Now, how could this possibly happen? Like I said, Bash is 20 plus years old and the vulnerability has existed essentially for all that time. Well, the problem is that Bash does allow code to be executed in environment variables. This is actually used as a feature sometimes. For example, if you set your command prompt, which is an environment variable on some Unix systems, you may add code to, for example, update the X term header to match the system that you're logged into and little tricks like that the problem is that bash doesn't correctly separate code and data and this is a hard problem in general we have problems with that all over the place you know cross-site scripting for a large part is a problem like that so the problem here is bash doesn't separate code and data with this data that a user submits maybe interpret as code and that's the problem here that's the root cause of this vulnerability and so why are there two CVE numbers if there's really sort of this one root cause to all of them. Well, it turns out yesterday the first vulnerability was announced only really considered one way to inject code into a bash variable. Earlier today, or maybe it was late yesterday, depending on your time zone, Travis came out with a second way how code can be injected. And this method was not patched by the patch that was released yesterday. Just for clarity, a second CVE number was assigned, but the root cause is the same. It's just two different ways to exploit this particular problem, and only one method was patched. So how do you find vulnerable systems? What I would do very first, maybe you can do this while you're listening to this webcast, do a Google search on your own domain. Check if Google finds any potential vulnerable sites. Now this is very incomplete and of course you'll get false positives with this because not all CGI bin URLs, not all files that end with .sh necessarily use bash, but it gives you the low-hanging fruit. This particular Google string was quoted many times, so this is what an attacker will try first to find vulnerable systems in your network. Do the same thing to get your high-priority items that you need to patch and that you need to investigate right now. The next thing you can do is you can log into the system directly, and here are two different strings that can be used to check if you're vulnerable. The first one will work if you have not applied the patch. So this first string will only work if you have not applied the patch. The second string exploits the vulnerability even after you have applied the patch. In the first case, it will just echo back this vulnerable message. The second one is a little bit more tricky. You will get an error message, but this script creates a file called echo, and then you're opening the file echo, and you check if the current date was written to this file, and that shows that you're still vulnerable. So first string will work only if you're not patched, so you can use it to prove that you're patched or not. The second uh, string will work if you applied the patch, so it exploits the second uh, method of exploiting this vulnerability, and you can use that to show that you're still vulnerable even after you applied the patch. Aside from that, many vulnerability scanners uh, did announce modules for this vulnerability. There are a couple of modules for Metasploit now. I just quote the URL for one of these modules here.
Now, what can you do to protect yourself given that the patch isn't complete? I would still apply the patch because at least it will prevent some exploitation. But like I stated, the current patch is available as of recording this podcast is not complete, but I expect a new patch to be out very soon. You can change your shell. The problem with that is while most Linux systems come with various shells, the problem is it will likely break stuff. So scripts that are written for bash typically don't run in these other shells and uh, that can cause a problem. You can still try it out uh, for some of your CGI bins, for example, and see if it works, at least uh, if the script still works, at least some of them will be protected as well. There are a number of uh, web application firewall and IPS rules. Most of the rules I've seen published so far are actually not that great. Let me go back to the exploit string. They're really only looking for this parentheses space squirrely bracket open. The problem with this is that's easily changed. You could add two spaces here or such. So uh, I consider uh, these signatures incomplete, but still apply them. Get the best signatures you can find out there because there is no fundamental patch out for the vulnerability so you really have to think defense in depth try the best you can do today to get yourself protected and then hopefully we will soon have a patch available so in summary a huge vulnerable population but a limited exposed population go after the CGI bin first Try to fix it, assume they're already compromised if they're publicly explo exposed and if Google can find them. And then apply the patch quickly and wait for the updated patch. OS 10 is also vulnerable. Uh, there is no patch for OS 10 right now. There is actually an updated patch that's available in source code form, but I would wait for the official package to come down from your Linux distribution. And then, like I always say, when we talk about Heartbleed, when we talk about these vulnerabilities, inventory. It's really important in these cases that you have a good inventory so you know which systems to patch first. And in this case, it's CGI bin running bash scripts. Well, that's it for now. Thanks again for listening to this. If you have any more details, please send us some information. Tell us what works, what doesn't work for you. We have sort of a little FAQ diary. There are a number of comments that you should look at with updates about this diary. And we will update this diary with links shortly. Thanks for listening. And that's it for today.